Hello and welcome to Voices of Wisdom from Native Cultures and Hey Haka Sapa or Nicholas Blackout for our discussion tonight. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one. Um, first of all, let me say that it is Black Elk who brought me into my study of Native cultures. Um, I don't. I was trying to remember. I don't recall when I first saw this referenced. It may have been Joseph Campbell uh, in his Power of Myth, or it may have been somewhere. Else. It's probably Vine Deloria, actually. Uh, his book, God is Red, which we'll talk about uh, next time, actually. In any case, I remember, I, I remember seeing Black Elk being referred to with great reverence uh, as, as a text that everyone studying Native cultures should know. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll read this and I'll know. It is a compelling book, uh, a very powerful book. Uh, for reasons that we'll talk about, uh, but also um, a book that is difficult. And uh, we'll talk about that too. So let's get to it. I'm gonna go over this again because it's so important. On studying Native American cultures, we must recognize first of all, before we enter any such discussion or study is that the importance of land and place for native peoples. And we are also standing on that land. And so if you don't begin a study with that recognition, then you, your, your study is gonna be off um, or at, at best incomplete. We are standing on this land here in America. And um, if you understand that, it will color everything you think about and talk about in regard to native cultures. Not only that, we, Euro-Americans and others, are standing upon this land, but that land is so important to native people. It is what shapes, I'm not sure that's strong enough, shapes their identity, it fills their identity. Um, their identity is the land, and so, when you hear about tonight the, the removal of Native people from their land, it is not a mere inconvenience. It is a loss of identity. And so we must recognize that. We must recognize what the colonizers did, which was if you want to thoroughly um, assimilate a people, colonize a people, then what you must do is take their language. And we saw already with Zikala Shah and others that <clears throat> this was a primary feature of the boarding school movement. First of all, you remove them from their land. Secondly, you forbid them to speak their language and, uh, and forget their history. And then uh, you change them by cutting their hair, which is a highly symbolic um, element of human existence in every culture. Is hair represents, it symbolizes. And so uh, to cut their hair, um, <clears throat> these children who are going to the boarding school, is a violation that's hard for us to, for, hard for Euro-Americans or non-natives to identify with. So there is a history here of white and native contact and ongoing relations. And again, any discussion of native American wisdom must include that. Else you are guilty of universalizing what is an ethnic notion, as Joseph Campbell put it. And we've talked about this before. I want to mention it again that to take something, a mythology, a story, a ritual, a belief, a tradition, and lift it out of its context is a violation of the ethnic source from which it sprang. And for some traditions, that's okay. In fact, it's by design. 
traditions that seek to become universal, to become Catholic, lowercase c, Catholic, um, they want this. They want this to become this ethnic tradition to become universal. Native people don't want this. They never wanted this. They never thought that their traditions would be universal. They never sought for them to be. Because universality is something that is a product of literate culture, of writing and print. It's also, as Sherman Alexie says, you can tell uh, when white people say something's universal, that means they understand it, meaning they have they have elided the ethnic reality from which these so-called universals sprang. And so what you're doing here is appropriation if you don't recognize that ethnic base, that ethnic origin of these stories. <clears throat> you must honor and respect that, and it goes right along with honoring and respecting the notion of land and that we are essentially trespassers on this land. And I don't say that lightly. You will see that um, tonight, especially in the treaties, that um, they're still valid. They're still legally valid. They have not been vacated. And so we are actually in violation of US law by being here. So we, we must be careful in our discussion of voices of Native American cultures, not to simply lift these cultures out for our own purposes without recognizing the land, the role of land and language and history. And it's not ours. It's just not ours. And so what are we doing here? Does this mean we cannot speak or hear Native voices? Far from it. Native voices are speaking. They have been speaking from the beginning of contact and before. So the question really becomes for me, how do we listen to these voices? And um, it can be very fraught, this area, but I think we can do it. I think we should do it, obviously, because that's why I'm offering this series. Um, we must hear these voices. Why? Because they're voices that deserve to be heard. Um, and honestly, they're voices that represent a world that is different from the Western world that most of us know. It's a different, well, it's just a different world. Um, a world being constituted by language, ritual, material, culture, etc. It's different. And Part of, I would say the larger part of obtaining wisdom is to open yourself up to difference. And that's very difficult, especially when your own tradition, your own ideology is arranged and calculated to eliminate difference. So the better part of wisdom is to listen to these voices that are speaking. And we must hear them coming from their land, from their story, from their place, but they are invariably caught up in, enmeshed in colonialism and Western ideology. And so they offer a critique of our own mythology. Now, again, we're very close to appropriation here, but we, we don't have to go there and we won't go there. We're not gonna use native people to cure our broken ideology, our broken mythology. This is much more basic than that. This has to do with knowing at all, how we know at all. We know by recognizing and hearing the other. What we have excluded either by design or by accident from our ways of seeing. And um, it's been a while since I told this story, but I think it's appropriate now because we're talking about speaking and listening. Eastman's The Soul of the Indian, Indian a story of the Seneca um, in upstate New York, what would become upstate New York, and a black coat or missionary comes to them and 
tells them the story of Genesis, an original garden that was perfect, an original couple who were perfect, but who sinned through the temptations of a serpent and a woman, according to the theology, and therefore fell and introduced death into the world. And, but the good news is, the good news, the gospel is that we can recover that original state by believing in a second Adam, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And eventually, those of us, the missionary says, who believe in him will go to heaven. Wouldn't you like to go to heaven? And the Seneca responds, that's a cool story. Uh, let us tell you a story about the origin of corn. And so they tell, they share their origin story. And the missionary becomes extremely upset uh, and, and is disgusted, the text reads, and says, listen, what I gave you was the truth. And you have responded with mere fable and falsehood. And the Seneca, who operate by rules of civility and in an oral culture and the, the conventions of storytelling are genuinely confused about this lack of civility in the missionary's response, among other things. And they say, we believed your story. Why won't you believe ours? We believe your story. Why won't you believe ours? And there it is. And there's the difference that we're talking about here, is being open believing other stories, or at least listening to them. We believed your stories, why won't you believe ours? Native people are speaking, we should be listening, we should be listening with care and with the values that are opposite of the colonial values, not to steal, not to appropriate, but to hear and recognize another way of seeing, another way of knowing that belong to the people on whose land we now stand. All right. So, Black Elk was from the Aglala Lakota Nation, or the Acheti Sakawin, the seven tribes, sorry, the Council of the Seven Fires. There they are in um, South Dakota on the current reservation, which is the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, I've been there and uh, been to Wounded Knee. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're sometimes called the Aglala Lakota Sioux. Sioux is not a, it's like Anazazi. It's um, not a preferred word because in the mix of misunderstanding of um, colonialism, um, whites, missionaries, and explorers ended up calling these people by the name that their enemy used. Uh, this would be the, the Chippewa. So Sioux probably means enemies, we think. So again, language, right? Language is so important here. And of course, they are also called uh, the Teton Sioux. And, and there are several groups within the Aglala Lakota and the Teton Sioux, for example, including the Brule and hunk papa, et cetera. And so you'll, you may see that, for example, Sitting Bull was a hunk papa Sioux, but uh, Black Elk is an Aglala. These are all related, um, but different groups. All right, so as early as 1825, a treaty was reached, was made, uh, guaranteeing the Sioux Nation control of lands that are today basically the Midwest and the Plains, the states of Iowa, Missouri, Wyoming, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North and South Dakota. This is 1825. So uh, it's just a couple of decades after the Louisiana Purchase, and there's so much land there that <clears throat> the fledgling American nation could not ever imagine needing it or wanting it, and so they provide it, they give it, give it uh, by treaty to this group. 
So what's, this is what's happening in the Plains. In 1830, there's the Indian Removal Act, where the horrible President Andrew Jackson um, accelerates the movement of Native Americans from the Eastern tribes like the Cherokee and the uh, Creek, et cetera, and uh, produces the Trail of Tears. And the Trail of Tears goes west. In fact, all trails goes, go west for both Native people in the East and for the fledgling American nation. And so one of the most devastating government acts of legislation or acts is the 1862 Homestead Act put forth by President Abraham Lincoln quote to elevate the condition of men to lift artificial burdens from all shoulders and to give everyone an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life and you may know about these stories it was the Homestead Act was repealed only in 1976 and basically it said that um, everyone going west could get 100, is it 160? I think it's 160 acres of land. Um, again, repealed only in 1976, 10% of United States land, 270 million acres was available for claims and settlement. And it was open to all US citizens or intended citizens. Four million homestead claims resulted from this act. 1.6 million deeds and 30 states were actually officially obtained in the Homestead Act. Um, Montana, North Dakota, Colorado, and Nebraska had the most successful claims and of course, Native people were there. They were there by right. Most of them uh, by legal right, many of them by moral right, all of them. Um, and yet here come the white settlers through the Homestead Act claiming their land. Now, this produces resistance as it should and leads to the emergence of one of the great Lakota chiefs of all time, Red Cloud. Mac Pia Luta, uh, and who initiates a war, 1866 to 1868, called Red Cloud's War. Uh, he was outraged that miners, homesteaders, etc., had been moving into the Black Hills uh, after the Civil War, and so he actually led a successful campaign against the United States during the Indian Wars. Um, there was resistance. There was resistance in the Southwest among the, uh, among the Pueblo uh, through a warrior named Pope. There was some resistance, some overthrow even. Red Cloud is at the center of this in the plains. And here is an important treaty, an important moment in this history. It's the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. Fort Laramie is in Laramie, Wyoming. And um, um, this treaty was vital. It was, it was a good treaty given everything that was in place. Um, and it granted a large reservation to the Lakotas. It guaranteed the absence of a military presence or oversight, no further settlements in the area, no reserved building rights, uh, for whites coming in. And so the resulting reservation include, included the entire Black Hills territory. And it was a major diplomatic victory for the Lakota uh, under Red Cloud's leadership. What happens? What happened every single time? The treaty was violated by whites especially the military. They were, the military were charged with enforcing the treaty and that included keeping white settlers out, miners, etc. Uh, this did not happen. 
And of course, the worst thing that could possibly have happened, well, not could possibly have happened, but a terrible thing that happened was the discovery of gold in the Black Hills in 1874. And so whites came pouring in looking for gold, and this led to what whites called the Great Sioux War of 1876 and 1877, um, where there was resistance as there had to be. Now, there's the flag of the Aglala Lakota Nation, which is red to represent um, blood, among other things. Um, and um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these events that happened after the discovery of gold in the Black Hills. So you will know of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, uh, along with Red Cloud, two amazing leaders of the Lakota people, and um, different and yet very powerful in their own approaches. And um, after the, the new influx of white settlers, uh, gold, people looking for gold, there, there was this resistance that I mentioned. Um, and so in 1876, thousands of Indians uh, leave, uh, of many tribes leave their reservations and gather in the valley of the Little Bighorn River. I think you know where this is going. And so there was always an overreaction by the United States military, especially the cavalry. In regard to Native people, we're going to see this again in a minute. So they again freaked out and mount a three prong campaign to compel the Indians to return to the reservation. Um, and then what happens, of course, is you may know the Battle of the Little Bighorn, where Custer and his troops marched into the middle of a Sioux camp on the Little Bighorn River, Sioux camp. Um, 268 members of the 7th Cavalry, including Longhair, as they called him, or Custer, died. You know this is Custer's last stand, and it reverberates throughout the country, um, shocking the, the emerging empire of the United States into um, the realization that uh, there is a resistance still um, and that they can be defeated. They quickly, the various Sioux tribes quickly leave uh, and are placed on reservations. Um, and they're forced now to sign a treaty, ceding the Black Hills to the United States, overturning the, tr the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. One of the most interesting phenomena in the Plains and in the history of Euro-American and white relations now occurs, and that is the ghost dance. We could do a whole series just on the ghost dance, but let me just briefly describe it for those of you who don't know it. The ghost dance was created by a man named Jack Wilson on the Paiute Reservation in Nevada. Uh, his name was Wavoka. And he had a vision. And his vision was that he imagined, he imagined a coming world in which a great wall of earth, or a wave, I should say, of earth would come through over the continent, especially the plains. And native people would be lifted up as this wave came through and as it wiped out the whites and their incursions and their buildings. Um, and then they, the native people would be, sit, would be sat back down onto the ground along with the buffalo that had been slaughtered by the whites who came in and, and decimated um, the buffalo herds, which were absolutely essential to life on the plains for native peoples. And he said he saw this in a vision, and, and of course, people said, how, how do I get the vision? And he said, you must wear a ghost shirt, 
which is, uh, you must ghost dance, I'm sorry, you must dance, which basically involved leaning back and spinning until you got your vision. Once you got your vision, you would paint it on a ghost shirt. And if, you, if your vision was good and true and you rendered it well, then the Calvary's bullets would not permeate the ghost shirt. And so this begins a whole new religion, in a sense, at least a movement uh, among the tribes. Uh, and it starts, like I said, in Nevada. Sitting Bull, I think he sends an emissary out or he goes himself. People start coming to this Wavoka and say, what's this about? And sensing a revolution, really. And it was uh, very much a revolution. It scared the hell out of whites, uh, especially the Calvary, who are always notoriously jumpy. And so you have now Indians gathering, Indians of all nations gathering and doing this ghost dance. Now all they're doing is dancing. They're just spinning. And then they, once they get a vision, they paint it on their shirt. That's all they're doing. It's a religious ritual. But of course, to someone with a political hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so the US government, especially the Calvary, thought that this should be put down. It makes people very nervous, white people very nervous. And so there's the tension rises and Sitting Bull is killed as a part of this. And, and again, I'm cutting this story very short. Um, so that we can get to Black Elk, but you should read it in Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee or in Black Elk Speaks. Uh, when Sitting Bull was murdered by tribal police, um, his horse stood up and did something like this, and the native people there, the hunk papa, said, look, they're ghost, he's ghost dancing, the horse is ghost dancing. And of course, um, this becomes so powerful. It, it's just a dance, but it becomes so powerful and so threatening that it ends up with the murders of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. And of course, the massacre at Wounded Knee, um, where Bigfoot, a chieftain named Bigfoot, had about 300 people with him, um, only about 100 warriors, and again, the tensions are so high because the Calvary is so nervous and something happens, as it always does, some misunderstanding, uh, some accident, whatever. And the United States Calvary ends up opening up on these people, men, women, and children, with their Hotchkiss guns and just leveling them. Black Elk was there, we'll see in a minute. Um, it is along with Sand Creek, one of the most horrendous massacres and stupid massacres, I guess they're all stupid, of Native people um, in our history. I should point out that Native people like Laguna Pueblo, Leslie Marmon Silco does not consider the ghost dance over. Um, I think you'll find this among a lot of Native activists and writers is that the ghost dance, because there's a different sense of time here, right? Because it's not about, I must achieve this objective right now or even within my lifetime. That's not part of it for native people who are shaped, fill their identities filled with land instead of time. And we'll get to this with Vine Deloria next week. They, they understand that it may take 500 years. And so for them, the ghost dance is still a lot. I actually saw a ghost dance shirt once in a museum, and you could see the bullet holes in it. Um, and that was in the Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow, Scotland, which, I mean, there's a whole story there, there of how a ghost dance shirt ends up in Glasgow. Um, but 
their point, if, if you read Silco and, and Alexi and Visner, is that the ghost dance is still going on. Uh, it, it may have ended. It was never about simple metal bullets, they would say. It was about the ongoing existence of native people itself. All right. Uh, again, I could do, we could do a whole discussion just on these histories, uh, which are so profound, but <clears throat> we should talk about Hehaka Sapa, or Black Elk, because he was there for all these moments. Uh, that, for these moments, I've been discussing those very profound moments in um, Euro-American native history, uh, the ghost dance, wounded knee, the battle of Little Bighorn, Black Elk was there. He was born, uh, we think, December 1st, 1863. It's uncertain. He died August 19th, 1950 um, at age, what is that, nine, yes. At age nine, he had a visitation by the Joaquinian, or the Thunder Beings, and you're going to hear about that. So he's nine years old, and he has a vision, a visitation by the thunder beings that changed his life at nine. I mean, can you imagine handling something like that at nine? And in fact, he, he didn't handle it well. I mean, I don't, you're not supposed to handle these things well because they're, they're the sacred breaking into an otherwise ordinary life. And you'll, you'll hear about how he handled it. He was at the Battle of, of the Little Bighorn in 1876. Uh, was he there 13? He talks in Black Elk Speaks about uh, being there and about trying to get a scalp and, um, and how difficult it was. So again, he's 13. How difficult it was to, to get a scalp from this soldier. And so he ends up just shooting him in the head instead. Um, by the way, scalping was not a native invention, uh, they took that from the French who came in through what is now Canada and the northern United States, but uh, they certainly used it. <clears throat> there are moments in Black Elk Speaks of brutality like this um, that can be arresting for white readers. They escaped to Canada. Uh, his Aglala people and him, 1877. I believe they call it grandmother land. Um, he comes back to the plains, to South Dakota, and joins Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, 1886. Travels around the world uh, with Buffalo Bill. Um, <laughs> gets left in Paris and has to be picked up again. I mean, it's an amazing life, as you can already tell. Uh, he was at the ghost dance, um, uh, sorry, at the ghost dance on the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1889, and then of course at the Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890, that's in December of 1890, and is generally considered, uh, by whom? Hmm. By some historians and by and at the time, it was considered by the American government and the larger American culture as the last battle. It's sometimes called a battle. There was no battle. Um, they were, Bigfoot's people were starving and um, only about 100 warriors who, who did try to fight back, but this was a massacre. Uh, I don't know that the cavalry lost anyone, but <clears throat> this was considered by those people, historians in the government and believers in the emerging American mythology as the last of the Indian Wars, as, that, as the end of Native people here in the United States. Native people would beg to differ, uh, but it does make a symbolic mark in history uh, for both peoples. And here's where it gets complicated, if it weren't complicated enough already. Um, Hehaka Sapa converts to Catholicism in 1904 and becomes Nicholas Black Elk. His Christian name is Nicholas. 
Black Elk Speaks, the book, comes out in 1932. He actually returns to Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in 1934. And if you've done any research on Black Elk, you now know that in just a few years ago, he was nominated for sainthood by the Catholic Church. Um, so yes, very interesting. So let's talk about the birth of Black Elk Speaks. That is the book. And the midwife of Black Elk Speaks is a man named John G. Nyhart, a well-known, well-respected poet. He was the poet laureate of Nebraska um, for many years. Uh, and he did a series of books about, a series of books of poetry about the Messiah craze, he called it, um, in the Plains in the late 19th century, and wrote these amazing, very elegiac poems about uh, Native people that he knew and, and had heard about. He goes to the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1932, or 31, I forget, um, before the book comes out. And hears of a man named Black Elk, who is a good storyteller. And so he goes, with the help of some people who knew Black Elk, he goes to meet him, and um, he finds that he is a profoundly melancholy man, Black Elk, uh, yet he is cheerful in all his human contexts. Uh, so immediately you get the sense of Black Elk as this tragic figure, a melancholy man who, who is, and not, not just from this quote, but from the Oh, from the preface to the book, or the introduction to the book, that Black Elk is this tragic figure who has the weight of history, and more than that, he has the weight of a vision upon him, a vision that has not come true, we'll talk about that in a minute, and yet still must be communicated. Um, and John Nyhart is entranced by this man, and he writes this, Nyhart does, it was not of worldly matters that he spoke most, but of things that he deemed holy and of the darkness of men's eyes. Although my acquaintance, my acquaintance with the Indian consciousness had been fairly intimate for more than 30 years, the inner world of black elk, imperfectly revealed as by flashes that day, was both strange and wonderful to me. All right, so this is pretty cool. And so what is Black Elk's response to this white man who has come to see him? And in fact, um, Nyhart and even some of Black Elk's companions share the story that there, that morning a woman reporter had come by to talk with Black Elk. And Black Elk is, says purportedly, you purportedly, Black Elk says that you are a very nice looking woman, but I have nothing for you. John G. Nyhart comes along later, and Black Elk says this. As I sit here, I can feel in this man beside me a strong desire to know the things of the other world. He has been sent to learn what I know, and I will teach him. There is so much to teach you. What I know was given to me from men, and it is true and it is beautiful. Soon I shall be under the grass and it will be lost. You, John G. Nyhart, were sent to save it and you must come back so that I can teach you. And in fact, he does, of course, come back uh, and takes down Black Elk's stories over several days. Um, Black Elk's son, Nyhart notes, Ben, acted as interpreter throughout the visit, and Nyhart says, my daughter Enid is a skilled stenographer and kept a faithful record of the narrative and the conversations. And so what the epigram to the book is, 
is Black Elk saying, basically blessing this book. What is good in this book is given back to the six grandfathers and to the great men of my people, Black Elk. Now, you might be wondering what sort of man John G. Neihardt is. Uh, and fortunately, I can show you because he made an appearance on an old interview show called The Dick Cavett Show. And I don't think he will disappoint. Here he is. I went up there during the summer. I knew lots of uh, Sue. I'd been there many times. And finally they came up with this. They said over here in the hills, over near Madison, there's an old man with the name of Ikaka Sapa, a black elk. And uh, he's a kind of a preacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. They didn't understand the, uh, the term Wichashawakan, which means a holy, holy man. He was, he was the man who had the vision upon which the ghost church was based. And I thought, gee, this is something. If I can only get to this man. What year was that? That was in uh, 1931. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, maybe he is peculiar. Maybe he won't talk to me. And went over there. When we got there, he was standing outside of a shade. Uh, that they make a shade, you know, to sit under, you know, and smoke their pipes in, in the mm -hmm. summer. And it looked as though he were expecting me. When we left, he wasn't supposed to talk to me. We went there at noon. We talked until after sunset. It was getting dark when we left. And Flying Hawk said, that was funny. I said, what was funny? He said, the old man seemed to be looking for you. And my son said, you know, I thought so too. And so did I. It seemed that he knew I was coming. Was there one moment where he decided he would talk to you? Was he He, he you looked a me over and he said, as I sit here beside this man, beside me, I can feel that, that he has a strong desire to know the things of the other world, spirit world. He has been sent to learn what I know, and I will teach him. Mm -hmm. It meant that he was giving me the power of understanding mm -hmm. and the help of the Great Spirit, this uh, feather, eagle feather, and uh, that he would teach me. And he said, you must come back after long about sunset. Uh, he had been talking all afternoon and telling me things, and uh, I could hardly believe my ears. It was such marvelous things. It is a new world to me. Mm. And he said, uh, this has been given to me from men. And it is beautiful and it is true. Soon I will be under the ground and it will be lost and you have been sent to save it and you must come back so that I may teach you. And he made me his spiritual son so that he could tell me these sacred things and I could tell the white world. I told the white world in Black Oak Speaks. Yes. and it's spreading all over Europe. Indeed, it did spread all over Europe and all over the United States and all over the world. And Black Elk Speaks, again, was for me my entryway into the study of Native American cultures, and it was for many, many people. And we're going to see about the reaction later on. My, one of my favorite parts of that is Nyhart getting so excited about talking about his visit with Black Elk that, I don't know if he just drops his cane or tosses it or lets it go or whatever, but he's very animated about um, his place in the Black Elk story, which is significant. Um, so here's what Black Elk says. This is the opening of the text. Um, talking to John G. Nyhart, my friend, I'm going to tell you the story of my life as you wish. And if it were only the story of my life, I think I would not tell it. For what is one man that he should make much of his winters, even when they bend him like a heavy snow? So many other men have lived and shall live that story only to be grass upon the hills. It is the story of all life that is holy and is good to tell. And of us two-leggeds, sharing in it with the four-leggeds, and with the wings of the air and all green things. For these are the children of one mother, and their father is one spirit. This, then, is not the tale of a great hunter or a great warrior or of a great traveler 
although I have made much meat in my time and fought for my people both as a boy and a man and have gone far and seen strange lands and men. So also have many others done and better than I. These things I shall remember by the way and often they may seem to be the very tale itself as when I was living them in happiness and sorrow. But now that I can see it all as from a lonely hilltop, I know it was the story of a mighty vision given to a man too weak to use it, of a holy tree that should have flourished in a people's heart with flowers and singing birds and now is withered and of a people's dream that died in the bloody snow at Wounded Knee. But if the vision was true and mighty, as I know, it is true and mighty yet. For such things are of the spirit, and it is in the darkness of their eyes that men get lost. Wow, very powerful, right? Uh, what an amazing beginning to his story. And, and it just gets better. Um, so it is not entirely chronological, but it is generally chronological. And so the first thing Black Elk does is um, introduce Nyhart to the sacred pipe. And he says, we must smoke the sacred pipe. And he says, it's, it's a good thing that I'm going to do this. And because no good thing can be done by any man alone, this is Black Elk, I will first make an offering and send a voice to the spirit of the world that it may help me to be true. See, I fill the sacred pipe with the bark of the red willow. But before we smoke it, you must see how it is made and what it means. These four ribbons hanging here on the stem are the four quarters of the universe. The black one is for the west where the thunder beings live and send us rain. The white one is for the north, whence comes the great white cleansing wind. The red one is for the east, whence springs the light and where the morning star lives to give men wisdom. The yellow is for the south, whence come the summer and the power to grow. And then he tells a great story of the aglala of the woman in the white, skin, uh, white buckskin dress. Um, and um, he, Black Elk says, this is a story about the way the pipe first came to us. This is a very long time ago. He says, two scouts were out looking for bison. And when they came to the top of a hill and looked north, they saw something coming from a long way off. And when it came closer, they cried out, it is a woman. And it was. Then one of the scouts being foolish had bad thoughts and spoke them out loud. But the other said, this is a sacred woman. Throw all those bad thoughts away. When she came still closer, they saw that she wore a fine white buckskin dress that her hair was very long and that she was young and very beautiful. And she knew their thoughts and said in a voice that was like singing, you do not know me, but if you want to do as you think, you may come. And the foolish one went toward her, but just as he stood before her, there was a white cloud that came and covered them. And the beautiful young woman came out of the cloud. And when it blew away, the foolish man was a skeleton covered with worms. Then the woman spoke to the one who was not foolish, <laughs> the one. You shall go home and tell your people that I am coming and that a big teepee shall sh be built for me in the center of your nation. And the man who was very much afraid went quickly and told the people who did it once as they were told and there around the big teepee, they waited for the sacred woman. And after a while, she came, very beautiful and singing. And she, as she went into the teepee, this is what she sang. With a visible breath, I am walking. A voice I am sending as I walk. In a sacred manner, I am walking. With visible tracks, I am walking. In a sacred manner, I walk. And as she sang, Black Elk continues, there came from her mouth a white cloud that was good to smell. 
Then she gave something to the chief, and it was a pipe with a bison calf carved on one side to mean the earth that bears and feeds us, and with 12 eagle feathers hanging from the stem to mean the sky and the 12 moons. And these were tied with a grass that never breaks. Behold, she said, with this you shall multiply and be a good nation. Nothing but good shall come from it. Only the hands of the good shall take care of it, and the bad shall not even see it. Then she sang again and went out of the teepee. And as the people watched her going, suddenly it was a white bison galloping away and snorting, and soon it was gone. This they tell, and whether it happened so or not, I do not know. But if you think about it, you can see that it's true. What a powerful story. What a powerful comment upon the story. I don't know if it's true, but if you think about it, you can see that it is. That's the difference between the Seneca, we believed your story, why don't you believe ours, and the missionary, there is only one story, there is only one truth. Well, it is, a, I wouldn't say it was an idyllic childhood for Black Elk, but it was a good childhood full of um, life on the plains. And that's one of the compelling aspects of Black Elk Speaks is you get an insight into what it was like to grow up and to grow into adulthood and live your adulthood as a plains um, tribesman. Um, but then, of course, there are the Wasichus the white people. Black Elk says, once we were happy in our own country and we were seldom hungry. For then the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds lived together like relatives, the humans and the animals. And there was plenty for them and plenty for us. But the Wasichus came and they have made little islands for us and other little islands for the four-leggeds. And always these islands are becoming smaller, for around them surges the gnawing flood of the Wasichu, and it is dirty with lies and greed. I, I like this very much about the book. His friends are there, Fire, Thunder, and Standing Bear, and they chip in to tell the stories, to elaborate upon the stories, and that is a good storytelling practice. Um, he writes it, and it was about when the bitten moon was delayed in the time of the popping trees, when the hundred were rubbed out. My friend Fire Thunder here, who is older than I, was in that fight, and he can tell you how it was. So Black Elk hands it over to Fire Thunder, who was there. Standing Bear says, I am four years older than Black Elk, and he and I have been good friends since boyhood. I know it was on the Powder River that we were camped and there were many cottonwood trees. Ponies like to eat the bark of these trees and it's good for them. There was the winter when High Shirt's mother was killed by a big tree that fell on her teepee. It was a very windy night and there were noises that woke me and then I heard an old woman had been killed and it was High Shirt's mother. So this gives you a sense of um, of the nature of the narrative here, it, it's very compelling. It weaves in and out of history and boyhood um, and adulthood memories, uh, things that seem that are sometimes just local color, like here's what it's like to go down by the creek. And sometimes it's these momentous intersections of Black Elk's life and the larger history like Wounded Knee. The centerpiece of the book is his vision, uh, a great vision that begins when he was young and continues on through his life. And in fact, you heard um, there that uh, earlier that Black Elk says that his vision was not realized and this is a great sadness to him. Uh, he feels like he's failed his vision. Uh, well, here is that vision. Um, Black Elk says this, it was when I was five years old, five years old, it begins, that my grandfather made me a bow and some arrows. The grass was young and I was on horseback. 
a thunderstorm was coming from where the sun goes down. And just as I was riding into the woods along a creek, there was a kingbird sitting on a limb. This was not a dream, it happened. And I was going to shoot at the kingbird with the bow my grandfather made and when the bird spoke and said, the clouds all over are one-sided. This is not a David Lynch film. The clouds all over are one-sided. And Black Elk says, perhaps it meant that all the clouds were looking at me. Maybe it is a David Lynch film, I don't know. And then it said, listen, a voice is calling you. Then I looked up at the clouds and two men were coming here, head first, like arrows slanting down. And as they came, they sang a sacred song and the thunder was like drumming. I will sing it for you. The song and the drumming were like this. Behold, a sacred voice is calling you. All over the sky, a sacred voice is calling. I sat there gazing at them and they were coming from the place where the giant lives in the north. But when they were very close to me, they wheeled about toward where the sun goes down and suddenly they were geese. Then they were gone and the rain came with a big wind and a roaring. I did not tell this vision to anyone. I liked to think about it, but I was afraid to tell it. I liked to think about it, but I was afraid to tell it. We can Make have some interesting reflections on just that moment, on having a vision, but not telling it because of fear. Well, he holds this, he's a young boy, he holds this out of fear, he doesn't tell it. He continues, while I was eating, a voice came and said, it is time. Now they are calling you. The voice was so loud and clear that I believed it. And I thought I would just go where it wanted me to go. And so I got right up and started. And as I came out of the teepee, both my thighs began to hurt me. And suddenly it was like waking from a dream. And there wasn't any voice. So I went back into the teepee, but I didn't want to eat. Manhip looked at me in a strange way. He was eating with his friend Manhip and asked me what was wrong. I told him that my legs were hurting me. Then there is the great vision. I cannot share with you this vision. It is too complex, too intricate. I simply refer you to it in the book. It is elaborate. Um, it involves horses and geese and the directions and roads of various colors, um, um, dancing horses that metamorphosize into other animals, grandfathers talking to black elk, the six grandfathers in fact, um, uh, water, the sky. Anyway, um, I I'm just not gonna attempt it because it's too intricate and you should read it for itself, read it for yourselves. But it is a fascinating, powerful vision. Honestly, I remember reading this for the first time as a young man having grown up in the South and being familiar with the book of Revelation and I thought that's the book of Revelation. It, it has that tone, that genre to it. Uh, strange things emerging out of other things and interacting, anyway, you can read it. Um, Whirlwind Chaser is a medicine man who sees that something has happened to this young boy. Black Elk says this, when I got back to my father and mother and was sitting there in our teepee, my face was still all puffed and my legs and arms were badly swollen. But I felt good all over and I wanted to get right up and run around. My parents would not let me because he has this vision and he thinks it's lasted a few minutes. They told me I'd been sick for 12 days, lying like dad all the while. And that whirlwind chaser, who was Standing Bear's uncle and a medicine man, had brought me back to life. I knew it was the grandfathers in the flaming rainbow teepee who had cured me, but I felt afraid to say so. My father gave Whirlwind Chaser the best horse he had for making me well, and many people came to look at me. And there was much talk about the great power of Whirlwind Chaser, 
who had made me well all at once when I was almost the same as dead. I was afraid. This is a leitmotif in the story is I was afraid. I was afraid to tell. I was afraid to tell. Powerful, amazing experiences that he's afraid to tell. Um, he, Black Elk says, everybody was glad that I was living. But as I lay there thinking about the wonderful place where I'd been and all that I had seen, I was very sad. For it seemed to me that everybody ought to know about it. But I was afraid to tell because I knew that nobody would believe me. Little as I was, for I was only nine years old. It's a common feature of a hero on a journey who, or anyone who experiences the sacred as the holy other. There's no way to describe it, and so it becomes difficult to tell. Also, he continues, as I lay there thinking of my vision, I could see it all again and feel the meaning with a part of me like a strange power glowing in my body. But when the part of me that talks would try to make words for the meaning, it would be like a fog and get away from me. That evening, when I came back, Whirlwind Chaser, who had gotten a great name and a good horse for curing me, came over to my teepee. He sat down and looked at me a long time in a strange way. And then he said to my father, your boy, your boy there is sitting in a sacred manner. I do not know what it is, but there is something special for him to do. For just as I came in, I could see a power like a light all through his body. When he was looking at me, when Whirlwind Chaser was looking at me, Black Elk says, I wanted to get up and run away, for I was afraid he might look right into me and see my vision there and tell it wrong. And then maybe all the people would think that I was crazy. For a long while after that, whenever I saw Whirlwind Chaser coming, I would run away and hide for fear that he might see into me and tell. Powerful, resonant stuff for anyone who has experienced the sacred, uh, much less a vision. Now, I'm going to stop with that part of the story because, uh, again, I want you to read it for yourself, but it continues. And there's another medicine man later who comes along and Blackout gets sick again because he hasn't told the story. He hasn't, he's keeping it inside because of fear. Fear is holding it inside and this is making him sick. Another lesson, perhaps. And this medicine man recognizes it and says um, that we need a ceremony. We need to act out your vision and, and they do and they arrange for uh, the horse dance and the heoka, the clown ceremony. Uh, Black Elk is also a clown, which is a feature in native, some native cultures. Um, so for the rest of the book, I, again, you're going to have to read it for yourself. There's just too much there to do it any kind of justice in a short lecture like this. But what we have is the history in the rest of the book and in the whole book, the history of the Oglala and the Wasichus. We have, as I said, the horse dance in the Heoka, the clown ceremony. We learn about Buffalo Bill's Wild West show from the inside and from a young um, native man who is a Glala man who is seeing this with his eyes and from his perspective and thinks it's crazy and a little fun, as one might. We experience the ghost dance from Black Elk's perspective, who was there. We experienced Sitting Bull, the death of Sitting Bull, told by Black Elk, a, a tragic death, a stupid death, as many of them were. Uh, he was killed by a tribal policeman. Um, and Wounded Knee, the bloody end of the dream, according to Black Elk, the end of the dream. The, his vision does not come true. His vision is of basically a, a healthy Aglala and Plains Nation with the buffalo back. It's the dream of the ghost dance. All right. Here is the ending of Black Elk. And um, 
Yeah, let me just let you hear his voice. Our party wanted to go out and fight anyway. This is uh, when they realized that they, the military resistance is going to have to end. But Red Cloud, the great Red Cloud, made a speech to us, something like this. Brothers, this is a very hard winter. The women and children are starving and freezing. If this were summer, I would say keep on fighting to the end, but we cannot do this. We must think of the women and children and that it is very bad for them. So we must make peace and I will see that no one is hurt by the soldiers. The people agreed to this for it was true. So we broke, broke camp the next day and went down from the Oanagazi to Pine Ridge and many, many Lakotas were already there. Also, there were many, many soldiers. They stood in two lines with their guns held in front of them as we went through to where we camped. And so it was over. It was all over. I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch as plain as when I saw them with my eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer and the sacred tree is dead. Well, as I said, a very powerful, compelling tragedy, really. That is the genre in which this book exists by all conventional understandings of tragedy. It, it crosses a lot of genres, sacred autobiography, travelogue, uh, history of the Great Plains, uh, etc. So in the epilogue, John G. Neihart talks about taking Black Elk, Black Elk back up to Harney Peak in the Black Hills, which is also, which has been renamed Black Elk Peak, which Black Elk in the book calls the center of the world, Harney Peak, Black Elk Peak. And I've been there and I've stood on it and of course it's the center of the world. It's the axis mundi of the mythological world. So Neihart describes taking Black Elk back up to Harney Peak at the end of his storytelling. And he watches as Black Elk stands again at the center of the world. And here is what Black Elk says, addressing the great grandfather. To the center of the world you have taken me and showed the goodness and beauty and the strangeness of the greening earth, the only mother, and there the spirit shapes of things as they should be. You have shown to me and I have seen at the center of the sacred hoop, you have said that I should make the tree to bloom with tears running. Oh, great spirit, great spirit, my grandfather, with running tears, I must say now that the tree has never bloomed. A pitiful old man, you see me here, and I have fallen away and have done nothing. Here at the center of the world where you took me when I was young and taught me here, old, I stand and the tree is withered. Grandfather, my grandfather. Again, and maybe the last time on earth, I recall the great vision you sent me. It may be that some little root of the sacred tree still lives. Nourish it then that it may leaf and bloom and fill with singing birds. Hear me not for myself, but for my people, I am old. Hear me that they may once more go back into the sacred hoop and find the good red road the shielding tree. Neihardt says that we who listen now noted that the thin clouds had gathered about us. A scant chill rain began to fall and there was low muttering thunder without lightning. With tears running down his cheeks, the old man raised his voice to a thin high wail and chanted, in sorrow, I am sending a feeble voice, O six powers of the world. Hear me in my sorrow, for I may never call again. O make my people live. Neihardt says, for some minutes the old man stood silent. 
with the face uplifted and weeping in the drizzling rain. And in a little while, the sky was clear again. Black Elk speaks. Yeah, for sure, Black Elk spoke. And so does John Nyhart. This is from an essay in Western American Literature by Sally McCluskey, published in 1972. And she notes this. Nyhart's book is a truncated, there are whole passages, there are whole stories that Nyhart did not include. Truncated and somewhat elaborated account of a man who had a career as a Sioux shaman and later converted to Christianity. Nyhart omits 40 years of Black Elk's life because he feels that white readers would find Black Elk's traditional religious experiences inauthentic if they knew he was relating them after he became a Catholic. While Nyhart felt great affection and respect for Black Elk, he did not really understand him. He, and he made the highly complex religious figure into a simplistic, if sympathetic, symbol of the defeat of the traditional Indian way of life. Wait, what? Well, yeah, um, the voice you are hearing, that beautiful, powerful voice is in fact, and Nyhart made no secret of this, Nyhart's voice. It was a brilliant, if flawed move for Nyhart's purposes, which was to tell this story in a compelling way. Um, the end of the book, the epilogue that I just read to you. Uh, McCluskey says this, it is a beautiful and fitting end to Black Elk's book and to D. Brown's book, uh, D. Brown, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and others pick up on this as this ending, which is so powerful, you heard it. Um, but Black Elk never said it. McCluskey writes, for all its ring of authenticity, it is Nyhart's. So the end of the dream is Nyhart's. The beginning of the dream is also Nyhart's. McCluskey continues, the book's opening is also Nyhart's. And as the ending fooled the educated ear of many scholars, including D. Brown, um, other critics, other readers, are seduced by this as well. And you, you remember, this is the beginning. My friend, I'm going to tell you the story of my life as you wish. And if it were only the story of my life, I think I would not tell it. For what is one man that he should make much of his winters, even when they bend him like a heavy snow? So many other men have lived and shall live that story to be grass upon the hills. It sounds very poetic, doesn't it? It sounds like it was written by a poet. It was. The, the beginning continues. It is the story of all life that is holy and is good to tell, and of us two-legged sharing it with the four-legged and the wings of the air and all green things, for these are the children of one mother, and their father is one spirit. No wonder this book resonated so much with white culture. It is a book written by a white poet. Now, McCluskey is, this is, she's writing in 1972, and you saw the interview with Dick Cavett around the same time. So she's a good scholar, and she's not simply going to let this lie here, because this is a pretty powerful charge. And so she goes and finds John Nyhart, who is elderly and not well, but he agrees to talk to her. And here's what she says. She writes, but it is Nyhart, speaking for Black Elk, who knows what he is doing. And as these two experts mistake, she's talking about the other critics who just assume that those words are Black Elk's 
even though Nyhart doesn't explicitly say they're not or they are, they make the assumption these two experts' mistaken identification of what is Nyhart's as Black Elks is a sort of tribute to Nyhart, and it is, who, when the occasion demanded, assumed a negative capability and became an Indian. Negative capability of a, is a Kate's term that means you move beyond the constraints of rationality for the sake of art. He said that there were certain things Black Elk was not capable of saying, things he would have said if he could. And Nyhart, both as poet and spiritual son, according to Nyhart, Black Elk named him Flaming Rainbow, said for him, pulling the parts of the book together into an artistic whole, I do not mean to imply that Nyhart fabricated any part of Black Elk's story, we're not talking about that, or toyed, toyed with the facts told him only that as an artist, he forged them into an organic whole, unified in tone, and that is, what is, that is another thing that is striking about this book, unified in tone, and as structured as far as it was possible to structure without falsification. So McCluskey is drawing these conclusions based on the evidence in front of her, on the page, and by recognizing that there is a unity in tone, that there are phrases that are distinctly poetic in an English sense, not in a Lakota sense. And so she goes and finds John G. Nyhart, and she asks him point blank. He is elderly, he is not well, but he agrees to talk to her, and he says this to Sally McCluskey. Black Elk Speaks is a work of art with two collaborators, the chief one being Black Elk. My function, this is Nyhart speaking, my function was both creative and editorial. I think he knew the kind of person I was when I came to see him. Indeed, you heard him repeat that in the Cavett interview. This is very meaningful to him. That's when he throws his cane away. I'm referring to the mystical strain in me and all my work. Black Elk said to me, this is Nyhart speaking, he said, you have been sent so that I may teach you and you receive what I know. It was given to me for men and it is true and it is beautiful and soon I will be under the grass, unquote, from Black Elk. And I think he knew that I, John G. Nyhart, was the tool, no, the medium he needed for what he wanted to get said. And my attitude toward what he has said to me is one of religious obligation. Okay, we're in a whole different world now, right? We're gonna talk about how that happened. But Nyhart continues. It is absurd to suppose that the use of the first person singular is not a literary device. Okay, I don't think that's absurd, Mr. Nyhart, because throughout the book, you have Black Elk saying, I did this, I felt this, I saw this. But, but we're supposed, the readers are supposed to know that the first person singular is a literary device used by you. By which I mean that Black Elk did not sit and tell me his story in chronological order. Okay, that's two different things, but okay. At times considerable editing was necessary, okay? But it was always worth the editing. The beginning and the ending are mine. There it is. They are what he would have said if he would have been able. At times I changed a word, a sentence, sometimes created a paragraph. Created a paragraph. And the translation, or rather the transformation of what was given me was expressed so that it could be understood by the white world. John G. Nyhart. Okay. What does that mean? Well, so much. So much. I should point out that um, in the complete edition of Black Elk Speeds, we have 
our next writer, our writer for next week, Vine Deloria, praising the book and dismissing these concerns raised by McCluskey. And, and we can talk about why that is. Uh, Deloria had a particular reason, an agenda, not a bad one, but an agenda for this book. And so he dismisses these claims. But what, what the issue gets to, it, well, not one thing, so many things having to do with studying native cultures and understanding this amazing book. The first, of it, first one is one that I have repeated here in many contexts and on many occasions, and that is the difference between orality and literacy. Black Elk did not write. He was an oral person living in an oral culture, even though liter literacy, writing and print was surrounding him. He is telling this story to a writer. And so the story must change. It always changes when you move, move from orality to literacy. And I don't care if it's the Bible or the Eddas or, what, or whatever. It always changes because the medium changes the message. So Black Elk, uh, who knows what he said? I mean, I, I happen to think he probably said most of this, but what we know, we know only through print and we know only through the medium, as he admitted, of John G. Nyhart. We know the story as John G. Nyhart knows it and shaped it and added to it. All right. So much to deal with here. Um, that's actually a fairly good oral storytelling phenomenon, is that stories get added to. The difference is you do that in the context of a storytelling ritual in an oral culture. You don't do it to sell a book. And you don't do it to say, I, he gave this to me. He gave this to me to share with you. I am the vehicle. You, you see, that's an incredible power move. I'm not questioning Nyhart's intentions. I'm questioning the outcome. What happened here is that this book, which is representative of the Plains culture and of native culture at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th, is the voice of the poet laureate of Nebraska. Is Black Elk in there? I'm sure he is. We just will never know where. Because of the differences between orality and literacy. And of course, we're talking about authenticity and story. Authenticity, such a fraught concept, authenticity. Um, and here I'm kind of going against what I just said. The notion of the authentic is a notion that arises out of literate culture. Right? Literacy being so, especially at this time in history, literacy being so concerned with disappearance of the oral. So Franz Boas, a great anthropologist, and his student, Elsie um, Clues Parsons, go throughout the Southwest to record these native stories before they're gone. And they do. But it's the same issue. The story, as told, has now been transformed into a piece of writing that exists in the Bureau of American Ethnography archives from 1921, or whenever. What is authenticity? There's no problem of authenticity in an oral culture because there's no I'm going to say this carefully. You can lie in an oral culture. You cannot lie structurally in an oral culture because the words are connected to the person. So if a person is lying in an oral culture, that person is dismissed. In a literate culture where the message is separate from the messenger, lies can 
flourish, thrive. The lie is a product of writing on a systemic basis. So authenticity becomes a concern of literate culture. Well, we've got to get to the, and you hear this all the time when people talk about the Bible. Well, you know, it's translations of translations of translations. Assuming that there's some original message there. Okay, maybe there is, but that's a literate perspective on original message. There is no sense of original authenticity in oral cultures. All right. There is, of course, biography and history, and this is one of the aspects of this story that is utterly amazing, this nexus of personal biography where one minute Black Elk is talking about hunting birds with his new bow and arrow his grandfather has given him to observing the massacre at Wounded Knee. It is powerful, and Neihardt did a brilliant job with this, of making a compelling story of a man's life that intersects with history. And, and in fact, that's got to be one of the most powerful, compelling aspects of this book, is how that intersection happens. You have a young boy, a humble man, who simply wants to tell his story, and he has a dream and a vision, and it ends so, so tragic. And yet, look, we can peer into this boy's life and these people's minds and experiences, and we can know native people. And maybe we do, I don't know. I'm just saying we can't know. Because Blackout told his story to John Nyhart, and Nyhart co-opted the story. And again, I don't question Nyhart's intentions. I think he heard a good story and he wanted to tell it, and Black Elk could not write it. And so Nyhart wrote it, and man, did he write it well. He, and that sense of unity, not only of tone that McCluskey talks about, but of, of, of scaling this from this little boy's experience to world events, uh, or at least national events, is incredible. He did a brilliant job, but it was him. There is also Nyhart's voice in the notion of religion in the book and in institutions. So remember that Nyhart was, he began his interest in the Plains uh, peoples by being interested in the Messiah craze, as he called it, with uh, Wavoka, Jack Wilson, and uh, the ghost dance, and the others. It's interesting how that's still treated, because there was an anthropological work called The Ghost Dance by James Mooney that treats it as a virus, the ghost dance as a virus. And that's not far from the word craze, right? So. Nyhart's, again, genius in producing this work of his own, using Black Elk, is that he was able to conjure that notion, too, of, of an institutional religion decimating religious experience. And, and remember, he was afraid to tell the other stories that Black Elk told him because he did not think they would be heard. So apparently his intentions are, are, are good. They're, they're, he's not trying to steal in, uh, outright. He wants people to understand Black Oak. I believe he did. And yet he's so trapped by literate culture, by American culture, by the nature of religion and how it's understood that there's, there's almost no good thing he could do here, right? He could perhaps have just said, you know what, this is an impossible task, and I'm going to let Black Elk go under the grass without telling his story. He could have done that. Um, I don't know. We wouldn't be talking about it tonight. Um, he decided not to do that and to tell the story. And so here we are. And we're telling, hearing a story that is emblematic, so emblematic of 
Euro-American and native relations, that there's, there's just almost no good choice here. Um, were Black Elk able to write, that would be a different story and native people, native writers that we're going to be talking about, and you saw with Zikala Shah and um, with E. Pauline Johnson, they get that voice out. And even then, it's a multi-vocal voice, um, multi-valent voice. But Black Elk didn't have that option. And, and so what we miss, what Neihardt chose not to tell, was actually the religion, what we would call the religion of Black Elk. The ceremonies of the sacred pipe, he tells at the beginning, but there's much, much more about that. And, and there's even another writer, Joseph Epis Brown, who comes along and writes a book called The Sacred Pipe, where he talks to Black Elk and he tries to, anyway, it's just so complicated. And it has to do, it's our complication. It's Euro-American complications. Black Elk has no problem <laughs> with his life and how he lived it and how he understood it. Um, sure, maybe he feels like the dream died with him. He's, he's not wrong. I mean, there was significant change in the religious practices of the Plains people after Wounded Knee. Um, but it's not like he's fretting over these issues that we're fretting over of authenticity and all that. He was simply authentic. We just don't get to hear his authentic voice or see his authentic religion because of institutional, especially Catholicism, interference. And of course, what we have here, at least on the surface, at least through Nyhart's voice is the power of ritual and vision. Um, I like to think that that still comes through in Black Elk. <clears throat> Again, I don't know what to believe here, um, but if, if Nyhart was a good storyteller in the sense that he conveyed what Black Elk was trying to convey to him, I suspect it's the power of ritual and vision. Now, again, this is all tinged with Nyhart's Catholicism and, and Americanism and all the isms. And so, like I said, I remember reading this as uh, a, a college student thinking, oh, well, and in fact, all these resonances, right? Like with tragedy and poetry. And I, don't, I remember... I was uh, doing biblical studies when I first read this, and I thought, well, that's the book of Revelation. And there's no accident that it sounds like the book of Revelation. Um, it is the same genre. It is the same medium. But I like to think that there was something incredibly powerful in the ritual and vision of Black Elk that comes across even in writing. So... The wisdom of Hehaka Sapa, well, it's hard to access it because we have to access it through John Nyhart. So the wisdom that Black Elk gives us, I think, is a wisdom that we have to turn back upon ourselves. Maybe that's all wisdom. What do we want from this story? What are we forgetting eliding, occluding, not including in this story. What are we hearing? What do we want and why? Again, when I read this, I was so amazed because there was just enough similarity for me to enter the world, the story world of Black Elk, and just enough difference to make it exotic. And it worked. And I would go on to get a PhD and do scholarly work in Native American studies because of this book. So again, let me reiterate some things I've said before. Guilt is not helpful. It's not a helpful emotion uh, to have in regard to this. Reflection is a good thing to do. And I still reflect upon this, uh, even as I was preparing for this lecture. 
Uh, what do I say about this book? This book that claims to be the voice of Hehaka Sapa, but whose voice is lost in the writing of John G. Neihardt. And yet, somehow, there's a larger story at work here where this book introduced me to that world as with the faults, with the problems that it has, and I was able to continue on into it. This happens often, by the way, in Native American studies. Some of you may know a book called The Education of Little Tree that was written by, well, the pseudonym is Forrest Carter, and it's the story of a Cherokee boyhood, and it's a lie. And the actual writer's name is Asa Carter, and um, he was a white supremacist. Uh, there was um, one of a, a professor at Emory University, my alma mater, who exposed this, and his name is Dan Carter, by the way. There are many of these. Hamaki Highwater uh, was a book I loved. I forget what it was called. Uh, I can see it now, but I can't remember the title. Hamaki Highwater, a fascinating, brilliant book on his people. I uh, forget which nation it was, but. It was really interesting because I remember him talking about dance and stuff. He was not native. He was exposed. So I think the wisdom for those of us who are not native in the story of Black Elk is to look at what we want from these stories and what damage we might be doing in wanting that and in taking that and in reflecting on how little we know about anything, but especially about Native cultures. And I thank you for your attention.